நண்பர்கள் அனைவருக்கும் வணக்கம் எல்லோரும் நன்றாக இருப்பீர்கள் This program is brought to you by Guruji TV. This YouTube video is a translation of the Tamil video of a renowned astrologer Jyotish Mahaguru Aditya Guruji. The link of the original version that is the Tamil video is given in the description box of this video. This is astrologer Deepa and I'm presenting you the English version of the Tamil video. Mr Ajay is one of my premium video subscribers and he has asked a question in his comment. He has commented that my explanation of astrological concepts is excellent and he has made a request. Let me read his comment first. Sir, each of your videos is excellent. Sir, until now, you have not explained the conjunction of two natural benefics, Venus and Mercury. Will the conjunction of Venus and Mercury benefit the natal of Mars ascendants? such as aries and scorpio and jupiter ascendants such as pisces and sagittarius you always say that it is good when natural benefics reside in the trine and when natural malefics reside in the quadrant house for the natal of scorpio ascendant it is an exception because venus becomes a lord of the 7th house of course the rule perfectly applies for the natal of scorpio ascendant except for the 7th house which is venus is there anything special about the natal of scorpio ascendant please explain sir well let me briefly explain first of all the second question when one house becomes an exception then you cannot call the rule perfectly applies to the natal of scorpio ascendant and let me answer in detail to your first question first of all the two natural benefics mercury and venus are monthly planets in other words mercury and venus are two planets that can traverse a rashi a house in a month mercury stays minimum of 14 days in a house and depending on its motion this may vary and venus will stay for approximately 23 days to maximum of 2 months depending on its motion though our planetary system is heterocentric jyotish is all about the perception of geocentric theory how do we see the planets from the earth plays a major role in the prediction What will happen to a living being on the earth from the point of view of being on earth is all about jyotish only people who did not know about astrology will question why we consider jyotish as geocentric theory but the scientists very well understand that why we consider jyotish as geocentric theory though in reality the planetary system is all about heterocentric system some rationalists even counter claim that how jyotish can be true while it celebrates a geocentric system whereas in reality it is all about heterocentric system jyotish actually is all about the perception of the planets from a geocentric point of view as we all live on earth it does not deny that the original system is heterocentric Both the natural benefics Mercury and Venus are monthly planets where Mercury stays minimum of 14 days in a house and depending on its motion this may vary. Venus stays approximately 23 days to the maximum of 2 months depending on its motion. Sun will traverse the house in 30 days. Each rashi in the natural zodiac was formed on the basis of the motion of the sun. based on the motion of the sun the rashis are divided into 12 in the natural zodiac having said this the conjunction of venus and mercury or parivartan of both is a unique one mercury is considered to be a benefic if only it is alone or when it is in conjunction with the natural benefic and what about the conjunction of mercury and sun 
If Mercury is in conjunction only with the sun, it is considered to be a malefic, not a benefic. This is a very important point. The lone Mercury is considered to be a natural benefic. And how much it has beneficial strength? It has 33% beneficial strength of Jupiter. To put it in very simple words, Jupiter, based on its strength, will deliver 100% beneficial strength. If it is about Mercury, it has strength that is equal to 33% of Jupiter's strength. Even at the fullest strength, Mercury gains only 33% of the beneficial strength in comparison to Jupiter. Sometimes even in my videos, I have mentioned that lone Mercury is such a benefic equal to Jupiter. It is something rare and it happens only under particular criteria. You will learn all those in the higher level of my astrology classes. Only when certain conditions are met, Mercury can have the beneficial strength equal to Jupiter. In general, Mercury is only 33% benefic when compared to Jupiter. And Venus will have the benefic strength which is 50% of Jupiter. Let me explain certain points before explaining the effect of conjunction of Venus and Mercury. Because when I say something spontaneously, you will find here and there certain subtleties of astrological concepts which will be very useful for you. It is good that you follow these points. Jupiter is a natural benefic which has 100% beneficial strength. Sometimes I mentioned in my videos that a full moon is more auspicious than Jupiter. What is the difference between these two natural benefics? Jupiter is a permanent natural benefic whereas moon can turn to be a natural benefic when it is Purnima or when it is heading towards Purnima and it can turn to be a natural malefic when it is waning or when it is heading towards Amavasya. Therefore, moon acts like a natural benefic and it can also act as a natural malefic. Your question is all about the conjunction of the two great natural benefics, Mercury and Venus. Let us come to the point post explaining certain concepts. I would like to first of all explain important points regarding the natural benefits. Based on my concepts of Subhatva, I have explained in my videos that Purnima moon is the one that can overwhelm the beneficial strength of Jupiter. However, when you assess the strength of the natural benefit, conventionally in an order, definitely Purnima will not come in the first place. Only as per Subhatva concepts of mind, Purnima moon can overtake all the other planets in terms of beneficial strength. What is the reason behind this contradiction? Because Purima will have the best beneficial strength only on one particular day. But Jupiter is not so. Even if Jupiter is debilitated, Jupiter is still a benefic. A noble man is always a noble man. In any situation, Jupiter is a natural benefic. Whereas moon, only on a particular day, that is during Purnima, it can overwhelm the beneficial quality of Jupiter. After 40 years of research in astrology, I realized that Purnima moon can be more powerful in terms of its beneficial strength than Jupiter. In categorizing the order of natural benefits in the conventional method, the waning moon is placed in the third place or even in the fourth place. Therefore, Jupiter always takes the first place in the order of natural benefits in descending order based on the beneficial strength and only on one particular day, which is Purnima, the full moon 
has the strength equal to that of Jupiter or even it can overwhelm the strength of Jupiter. This is why I call the moon the greatest natural benefit when certain conditions are met. And let me tell you one more important point which astrologers and my followers should definitely understand. You should definitely know the strength of beneficial level of Jupiter and Venus comparatively. I'm touching on a lot of other points before explaining the conjunction of Venus and Mercury. But all these are important points, whatever I say now. Definitely I'll give you all the points regarding the conjunction of Mercury and Venus. When you arrange the natural benefits in a descending order, based on their beneficial strength, Jupiter will take the first place. You can give 100 marks to Jupiter. In this order, only one day, one particular day, which is Purnima, Moon takes the first place. On Purnima, you can give 100 marks or even 110 marks to Jupiter in terms of beneficial strength. Definitely on Purnima, Moon acts as the greatest natural benefit which has more beneficial strength than Jupiter. This is the reason when I took a session regarding Subhatva, I placed Purnima Moon as the most significant natural benefit and assigned first place to Purnima Moon. Well, what is the subtlety behind the statement of mine? Any idea? Can you guess the reason behind this? How do I say that Purnima Moon can overwhelm the Jupiter in terms of beneficial strength? What is the reason? Why on Purnima I consider Moon as the most beneficial planet than any other natural benefits? Astrology is nothing but a collection of facts and implementation of the best scientific methods. Let me explain this scientifically. Jupiter is far from the Earth and Moon is much closer to Earth. The Purnima Moon is very close to Earth and therefore we get enormous light energy from the Moon. Jupiter is very far from the Earth. Having said this, during Purnima, we get more light from the Moon than we get from Jupiter. On Purnima, the whole Earth is beautifully illuminated by the moonlight. The full moon has a great influence on the minds of the people. We all have a josh during the full moon. We will definitely see our minds to be clear and balanced. The full moon not only influences the minds of the people, it even influences the ocean and you can very well see with your own naked eyes. You can see high tides during Purnima. We can see high tides in the ocean. Moon has a great influence on the earth. When full moon has influence on earth, will it not have influence on those who live on the earth, which lives on the earth? The full moon has the strength that can stir up emotions and provoke certain behavior in the minds of the people. We will definitely find the difference between our emotions during the full moon where there is fullest light energy against Amavasya where the light energy is totally absent. As per concepts of Subhatva, I will definitely say full moon is equal to the natural benefit Jupiter or it, even it can overwhelm Jupiter on one particular day which is Purnima. Jupiter is a permanent natural benefit which has 100% light energy. Now let us assess how much strength Venus possesses as a natural benefit. Venus has only 50% of the strength of Jupiter in terms of beneficial strength. If you are going to give 100 marks to Jupiter, assessing the strength of the beneficial level, you can give only 50 marks to Venus in terms of a benefit when compared to Jupiter. 
Venus can make Subhatva, which is 50% of Jupiter's strength. If you question me, how do I assess strength? I will suggest you to recall the Puranic stories. Shukracharya was the son of sage Bhrigu and he was also the guru of demons or asuras. Shukracharya had lost his one eye to Vamana, the dwarf incarnation of Lord Vishnu. Behind every Purana, you will see a truth, hidden truth or sometimes obvious. When Lord Vishnu appeared as Lord Vamana in the Yajna or the sacrifice ground of King Bali, Shukracharya sensed an impending danger. Shukracharya warned King Bali that this dwarf was no ordinary human being, but it was Sri Hari Vishnu himself. The King Bali was pleased to make any offering that the little Vamana asked. King Bali said, What more can I achieve when God Sri Hari Vishnu is standing before me and asking for dana, that is gift? King Bali readily agreed to give the three steps of land that was asked by Vamana. Now, it was the duty of the head priest, Shukracharya, the guru of demons, to read the mantras and pour water from the vessel to fulfill the dana. To deny the dana, Shukracharya entered the vessel and blocked the water from flowing from the vessel's sprout. Vishnu, who was very well aware of this trick, put a straw in the vessel's sprout which entered the eye of Shukracharya and thus blinding him. Unable to bear the pain, Shukracharya moved out of the vessel's sprout, thus the dana was fulfilled. Soon King Bali did the Sangalpa and agreed to the three steps of land as asked by Vamana. This story says how Shukracharya became blind in one eye and let us use this story, use this Purana to realize the concept that Shukracharya, Venus, has only 50% strength of Jupiter who is Dev Guru, Guru of Devas. Every Purana has a message to convey to you. I have written in my article Ungal Jadagam Yoga Jadagama that though many Puranic stories seem to be obscene, seem to be vulgar, have a very strong message to convey to you. The Puranas are meant to express a strong message to the people. For example, though the story of Moon and Mercury in the Purana narrates extramarital affairs, it is used to convey the message that the Moon, which is said to be mother of Mercury, likes Mercury very much. Of course, as a mother, it is quite natural to love the children, whatever status they are, though they, they does not like the mother. Whereas Mercury, which got humiliated in the society, hates its mother moon. In the Puranic period, during the Puranic period, there is no paper or pen. Students are expected to memorize everything. Therefore, Acharyas or the great Rishis took stories as instruments in order to make the student remember certain information. The stories are easy to remember and will not definitely forget the message conveyed by the stories. The Shukracharya story is one such. What does it mean when we say Venus is one eye blind? It means it has only 50% of the benefic strength of Jupiter. I have already listed the benefics, natural benefics in the descending order based on the beneficial strength. In order to distinguish further how much percentage Jupiter will make Subhatva, how much percentage Jupiter will make Subhatva, how much percentage Venus will make Subhatva, we have to understand these stories. I am touching these concepts apart from Venus and Mercury conjunction because it is very important for an astrologer to understand and to assess the strength of the beneficial level of a natural benefic in its own natural state. In the descending order of the beneficial strength, Purnima will win 
the first place which is equal to Jupiter or which can overwhelm Jupiter in terms of its beneficial strength. Jupiter on all the days during any season is considered to be the greatest natural benefit. The light energy of the Jupiter can be further assessed based on certain facts like whether Jupiter is in conjunction with Rahu or it is exalted or whether Jupiter is debilitated, its state is in Navamsha, in which house it resides, etc. In comparison to Jupiter, which is said to have 100% beneficial strength, Venus is said to have only 50% of the strength of Jupiter. In order to explain this and to make astrology learners to memorize easily, Shukracharya's story was told. What does it mean when we say Shukracharya is blind in one eye? It means his vision, his aspect has only 50% strength. In other words, Venus will have the aspect strength which is 50% of the aspect of Jupiter. This is the message conveyed by the Puranic story of Shukracharya. This is the difference between the aspect of Jupiter and the aspect of Venus on a Baba or on a planet. Reduce 50% strength from that of Jupiter's aspect while you are assessing the strength of Venus, aspect of Venus, you will definitely get the result. Jupiter will make a planet or a bhava more subhatva than Venus. When Jupiter is in good status, when it is not affected by any other planet, it will make a planet or a bhava 100% subhatva. Venus can make Subhatva only 50% in comparison to Jupiter. And what about the strength of aspect of lone Mercury? Mercury will have 30 or 33% strength of the Jupiter. Mercury which is lone, which is not in conjunction with any natural malefic, will have 30 or 33% of the strength of Jupiter. Suppose if Mercury is in conjunction with another natural benefic, the aspect of Mercury will have more strength. You have to understand these concepts based on Subhatva and Sukshma strength. You know I have written in certain articles that the lone Mercury is equal to the strength of Jupiter when certain conditions are met. Please remember Mercury can have the strength equal to Jupiter only in exceptional cases which I'll teach you in higher level of astrology online classes. Now let me explain everything in general terms. When Mercury is not in conjunction with any natural malefic and moreover when it is in connection with a natural benefic, its aspect will have more strength. So, in the order of the power of beneficial level of the natural benefits, the full moon takes the first place, but only Purnima moon can take the first place and the next place goes to Jupiter, third place goes to Venus, which is 50% strength of Jupiter, fourth place goes to Mercury, which is lone Mercury, which is not in conjunction with any malefics. The aspect of lone Mercury will have 32% to 33% of the strength of Jupiter's aspect. This is the level of benefits that a natural benefit can give you. You know the reason why I explain all these in detail. You got the idea? Sometimes your client may question you whether he will earn 100 crores of money or 50 crores of money or 1000 crores of money, whether he will beat Ambani in the race of earning money. In order to answer such clients, you have to definitely understand the power of the aspect of every natural benefit which differs. In order to make predictions, you have to assess whether the house of wealth is aspected by Jupiter or Venus or lone Mercury or full moon and you can make predictions based on this. You can also check which planet is in conjunction with the Lord of House of Wealth and to make further predictions, you can check 
द धनस्थाना सच एज सेकेंड हाउस नाइन्थ हाउस एंड इलेवेंथ हाउस बेस्ड ऑन द लाइट एनर्जी ऑफ द नेचुरल बेनिफिक एंड द कनेक्शन ऑफ नेचुरल बेनिफिक्स टू द धनस्थाना एंड बेस्ड ऑन द कंजंक्शन और द पोजिशन ऑफ द लॉर्ड ऑफ धनस्थाना यू कैन मेक प्रडिक्शन अबाउट हाउ मच अ क्लाइंट विल अर्न इन कंपेरिजन टू जूपिटर मर्कुरी गेन्स थर्टी परसेंट और थर्टी थ्री परसेंट स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ द स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ जूपिटर प्लीज रिमेंबर दिस इज अबाउट लोन मर्कुरी विच इज नॉट इन कंजंक्शन विथ एनी नेचुरल मेलाफिक when mercury is in its own house or exalted definitely mercury will have 32% to 33% the strength of jupiter suppose if mercury is in conjunction with venus or jupiter mercury will have more light energy suppose if mercury is in conjunction with venus definitely its aspect will have more effects when a natural benefic is in conjunction with another benefic definitely there will be more benefits in other words when two good people meet each other the place of meeting will definitely be glorified if two bad people meet together or join together the place will definitely be spoiled by the bad people if two good people meet you can expect a lot of positive vibration good vibe around their place This meeting of two good people logic can be applied to the conjunction of Mercury and Venus and based on their position in a particular house the effects will be more or less Let me add an information here I explained about Purnima moon in terms of its light energy or beneficial strength What about the waxing moon which is heading towards Purnima but still not at reached purnima finally the fourth place goes to the waxing moon jupiter venus lone mercury and the waxing moon are said to be the natural benefics and in the right descending order in terms of beneficial strength i already mentioned that purnima has the strength equal to jupiter or it can overwhelm jupiter in terms of light energy only on purnima having said this how to assess the strength of waxing moon astrologically what is waxing moon waxing moon is a moon which has crossed amavasya at 0 degrees and it travels 180 degrees to reach the purnima status At 180 degrees moon gets the fullest light energy. At 180 degrees from the sun moon gets the fullest light energy. I would like to add one extra point here. Moon gets exalted in Taurus where it gets good sthana bala and if moon has to be purnima while it resides in Taurus it will be the month of Kartikeya or Kartika mid november to mid december i have already mentioned about this in my videos moon is a planet which gets exalted every month in taurus however the exaltation status and the fullest light energy of the moon will happen only once in a year during kartikeya month which is called as tirukartikeya in tamil It is during Tirukartigai in Tiruvannamalai. The lamp is lit at the summit of the Tiruvannamalai holy mountain. We all celebrate this particular occasion in a grand manner. The Tirukartigai Purnima is the Purnima which is the most significant of all the Purnimas and which is celebrated by all the Tamilians. in general the moon which is at 180 degrees to the sun will have the strength equal to jupiter or it can have even more strength than jupiter i'll teach you how to assess the subhatwa level of the moon in this video treat purnima moon which is at 180 degrees to the sun as jupiter purnima moon is equal to jupiter when the moon is ashtami or navami tithi it will be in the quadrant to the 180 degrees position to the sun 
When moon is in the seventh quadrant to sun, the moon will make Subhatva, which is equal to 50% strength of Jupiter. I repeat, when moon has crossed Amavasya, on the third or fourth tidi, during the waxing phase, Trithiyai or Chaturthi, it will make Subhatva, which is 25% of Jupiter's strength. When it is Ashtami or Navami, in the waxing phase, the moon is in quadrant to sun. Moon will make Subhatva, the planet it aspects or with which it is conjoined with 50% of the strength of Jupiter. When moon has crossed Amavasya and during waxing phase, Drithiyai or Chaturthi, it can make a planet or a house Subhatva, 25% of beneficial strength of Jupiter. When moon has crossed Saptami and when moon is in quadrant to sun, during Ashtami or Navami, it will make a planet or house 50% Subhatva of the beneficial strength of Jupiter by its aspect or by conjunction. When moon is in 4th house to sun, it is Ashtami or Navami. When it is in 5th house or 6th house, the, during the waxing phase, it will be like Dasami, Ekha Dasi and it goes on like this. You have to increase the percentage of Subhatva based on subsequent Titis. When moon crosses Ekha Dasi, it gains 70% strength of the Jupiter and then during Dvadasi, another 10% is added. During Chaturthasi, moon will have gained 90% strength of the Jupiter, that is on the 14th day. And during Purnima, moon will have 100% light energy. Indeed, here we make Jupiter or we consider Jupiter as a benchmark to assess the beneficial level of other natural benefits. I hope you all know the concept of Indulagna. The great poet Kalidasa assigned a constant value or points to all the planets. He assigned 30 points to Sun, he gave 16 points to Moon, 6 points for Mars, 8 points for Mercury and it goes on. In the same fashion, you have to assess the strength of the Subhatva. We are giving a 100% or 100 points, a constant 100 points for the natural benefit Jupiter. And for Purnima moon, we are giving 100 points, which is equal to the strength of Jupiter or even little more. Maybe we can say 110 points. We are assigning 50 marks to the natural benefic Venus and 30 or 33 points are assigned to lone Mercury. And how can we give marks to the waxing moon that is heading towards Purnima? For the second Tidhi, that is Dvitiya, you can give 10 or 15 marks and for the third tithi, Dhritiya, you can give 15 to 25 marks. During Ashtami or Navami, moon attains 50% strength. During Dashami and Ekadashi tithi, definitely moon will gain the strength of 60% of Jupiter or more. And during 14th tithi, Chaturdashi, moon will definitely have 95% strength of Jupiter. And finally, during Purnima, we can assign 100 points to the moon, to the full moon. This is one of the rules of Subhatva that you have to realize in order to make the finest predictions. The reason why I explain the strength of natural benefit is when a client approaches you that how much he will earn in his life, how much fame he will gain in his life, what sort of position he will hold in any profession, whether he will become a boss or servant in a domain, whether he will become a CEO of the company or whether he will be a project lead in a company or whether he will work as a menial worker in a company or watchman in the company, you have to make use of these Subhatva rules. Let me give you another example. When a politician approaches you to know his future, based on the concepts of Subhatva, you can identify if the client will become a president or prime minister or chief minister or a mayor or a VAO. Based on Subhatva of the planets, you can identify which particular position a person will hold in their profession. 
You can make your predictions accurately when you are able to assess the strength of the planet in a natal chart. Well, now let me read the question of the subscriber again. He has asked how to predict the conjunction of the two natural benefics, Venus and Mercury. I have explained so far about the different levels of Subhatva of the natural benefics. This is a very important and fundamental point while making predictions. He has asked about the prediction of the conjunction of Mercury and Venus. The prediction of the effect of conjunction of Venus and Mercury will differ based on which house the conjunction is happening and for which ascendant. I will tell you one important point. In general, Mercury is a planet that will not give favorable results to the native of Aries and Scorpio ascendants. Because for both ascendants, Mercury becomes the Lord of Durstana. For the native of Aries ascendant, Mercury is the Lord of the sixth house, and for the native of Scorpio ascendant, Mercury becomes the Lord of the eighth house. The conjunction of Venus and Mercury will be favorable only to Venus team ascendant such as Taurus ascendant, Gemini ascendant, Virgo ascendant, Libra ascendant, Capricorn ascendant and Aquarius ascendant. Now let me take the conjunction of Venus and Mercury in house of Aries. This is not a good conjunction at all. In general when Venus and Mercury are in conjunction Without connection of Sun, it is good. When Venus and Mercury alone or in conjunction, that particular native will be highly intelligent, whatever ascendant he is. What is the reason? Though Mercury might be functional malefic to a particular ascendant, Mercury will deliver its karaka. For the native of Aries ascendant, Mercury should not gain more strength. Because Mercury is the lord of the sixth house for the native of Aries ascendant. Let us assume that Mercury resides in the sixth house for the native of Aries ascendant. The native will be super intelligent. Though Mercury is a functional malefic, for the native of Aries ascendant, it will not fail to deliver its karaka, which is intelligence. The native will be a good businessman, will be extremely intelligent because Mercury will deliver its karaka to any ascendant when its status is good. The communication skill will be excellent. The native will dance well, sing well. The native will have excellent knowledge in writing and will be very keen in excelling in leading the team. By the intelligence, the native will definitely try to win. Mercury is a planet that keeps our mind always young. I have written about this in an article. Mars is a planet which is responsible for keeping the body young. If both Mercury and Mars are in good strength in a natal chart, the native's mind will be young and they will be always active. They will never seem to be old, though they are old enough. And first of all, they will not feel themselves to be growing old. They first of all believe themselves to be very young, always, though they grow old. When you start believing yourself to be old, definitely it will reflect in your face and body and others also perceive you the same. On the contrary, if you believe that you are very young, even at 70 years of age, that will not get reflected in your face or body. Mercury keeps one's mind very, very young. Though one becomes 90 years old, the inner feeling of the native will be like, as if they are 20 years old, they are a teen. Mercury is the planet that keeps the mind of a person to be always young and Mars is the person that keeps the body of the person always young and active. 
when the conjunction of mercury and venus happens in aries for the native of aries ascendant it will make aries subhatva for the native of aries ascendant the lord of the 6th house resides in the ascendant itself and we have to make further predictions based on these points when the conjunction of venus and mercury happens in taurus it is like two friends are meeting in a place which is very amicable it means that two friends are enjoying the time together when the conjunction of venus and mercury happens in taurus the two friends will enjoy singing dancing happy together this will apply to whichever lagna it is venus and mercury will deliver the auspicious house effects of taurus with their karaka when venus and mercury are in conjunction in taurus you have to first of all identify which house taurus is to a particular ascendant based on the ascendant venus and mercury will deliver its effects these two planets make this particular bhava subhatva even if it is 6th house to the ascendant or 8th house to the ascendant these two planets will deliver the complete house effects now let us see the conjunction of mercury and venus for gemini ascendant mercury is in the own house in gemini venus is residing in its friendly house when venus and mercury are alone in gemini they will definitely do the auspicious house effects of the gemini this applies to whatever ascendant it is now let us see cancer the conjunction of venus and mercury in cancer is not considered to be auspicious because the house lord of cancer is an enemical planet to venus and moon is the deadliest enemy for mercury it will be a great struggle for these two planets when they are in conjunction in cancer because both the planets treat moon as their worst enemy mercury treats moon as its worst enemy and and venus as well treats moon as its enemy since cancer is a watery house and also a mobile sign it will make the native to move abroad and will deliver sudden unfavorable results based on which house cancer is to a particular ascendant you have to make predictions whatever lagna it is this conjunction is not good for both the planets it is not a house they prefer for mercury it is a house of its deadliest enemy and for venus also it is a house of its enemy what will be the consequence of this conjunction in cancer about the planets venus and mercury will reduce their karaka and will deliver the pabatwa house effects both the planets venus and mercury will be in avastha when they reside in cancer now let us see how to make predictions when the conjunction of venus and mercury happens in leo mercury treats sun as its most friendly planet and venus treats sun as its enemy try to perceive this conjunction by using human relationships as a model mercury will be in a very comfortable state when it resides in leo because it is in conjunction with its friendly planet venus and it resides in the most friendly planet's house venus will feel a bit irritated because though it is in conjunction with its friendly planet mercury it resides in the house of its deadliest enemy venus will lose its strength to deliver its karaka completely mercury can deliver its karaka completely because it is in the house of its most friendly planet and moreover it is also in conjunction with the friendly planet here mercury will gain more strength and during its dasha it will deliver lot of benefits based on its karaka and the house effects based on which ascendant leo is you have to make predictions when venus is in conjunction with mercury alone in leo venus will not deliver benefits during its dasha now let us see how the planets will behave 
when they are in conjunction in Virgo. When Venus resides in Virgo along with Mercury, it gets Nietzsche Bhanga Raja Yoga status. Mercury gets exalted in Virgo. What does it mean? When we say Venus gets Nietzsche Bhanga Raja Yoga status. Mercury gives its energy to Venus. Though initially Mercury is strong when it gives to Venus its energy, Venus becomes stronger than Mercury. Mercury will lose its strength, lose its energy proportionately based on the degrees of conjunction with Venus. The great poet Kalida says when a debilitated planet is in conjunction with the exalted planet, the exalted planet gets Sunyabara. The great poet Kalida says this point in Uttrakala Amrita, which is considered to be an astrological treasure. This is a very important point that you have to definitely consider. Here during the show of Venus, it will deliver great benefits. You have to definitely check the star lord of Venus. Because the star lords of the stars in Virgo are Sun, Moon and Mars. There are three stars in Virgo such as Uttara Falguni or Uttiram, Hasta and Chitra whose star lords are Sun, Moon and Mars respectively. Venus during its dasha will deliver the benefits, will deliver auspicious house effects. Now let us see the effects of the conjunction that happens in Libra. When Venus and Mercury are in conjunction in Libra, it is considered to be a yoga for both the planets. When Venus and Mercury reside in Libra, Venus will have its own house status. For the native of Libra ascendant, Mercury gains Digbala. Mercury resides in its friendly house. When Venus and Mercury are in conjunction in Libra, both the planets are happy enough to deliver very auspicious effects during their dasha and based on which house Libra is, you have to make further predictions. When Venus and Mercury reside in Libra, both the planets will be in a harmonious state of mind. They are very happy. This is considered to be very, very special. Now, let me explain the conjunction of Venus and Mercury in the house of Scorpio. For both the planets, it is the house of an enemy. For Venus, it is a neutral house and for Mercury, it is the house of worst enemy. When the conjunction of Venus and Mercury happens, Mercury will be in the 6th house to Gemini and 3rd house to Virgo. And Venus will be in the 7th house to Taurus and 2nd house to Libra. Based on which houses are Taurus, Gemini, Virgo and Scorpio, you have to make predictions. To make a good prediction, you have to check the strength of the dispositor, Mars. In brief, the conjunction of Venus and Mercury in the house of Scorpio will not deliver great benefits. Because for Mercury, it is the house of enemy. Mars also treats Mercury as its worst enemy. Now let us see how the conjunction of Venus and Mercury work when it happens in Sagittarius. Sagittarius will be a neutral house. For Jupiter, no planet becomes an enemy because Sagittarius is a calm and composed house. Moreover, Sagittarius is a spiritual house of Jupiter. Sagittarius is a dual house and it signifies a holy lamp glowing or burning. There are many differences within the fire element. Aries signifies a forest fire. Leo signifies a fire which is stable, which helps to cook, which helps to boil, which is used for a purpose. Whereas Sagittarius signifies a holy lamp. Aries, Leo, Sagittarius, all these are fiery houses based on the Panjabuddha Tattva. 
I have mentioned the difference between these three fiery houses in some videos. Aries is owned by Mars and therefore the fire signified by Aries is something uncontrollable. And moreover, Aries is a Chara Rashi. This house signifies a forest fire. Leo is a fixed sign and fiery sign. Therefore, Leo signifies a constant, a stable fire such as gas stove fire which we make use of to cook. The fire in a gas stove is signified by Leo. Sagittarius is a dual sign and also a fiery sign and it signifies the holy lamp. Sagittarius is a neutral house for both Venus and Mercury. However, Jupiter and Venus have contrasting characters. Venus and Jupiter are not enemies but they have contrasting characters. This is the way you have to understand astrology and this is my method of explaining the concepts to you. As per Bhavad Bhavam, Venus will be in the 6th house to Taurus and Mercury will its aspect its own house Gemini when they reside in Sagittarius. When Venus and Mercury alone or in conjunction in Sagittarius, they will not deliver much worse effects. It is good to a certain extent because it is the house of Jupiter. This is the house of a natural benefic. It is the house of a very honest and good man. When you enter into the house of a very honest and noble person, your thoughts also will transform into better ones. This is the way you have to understand the concepts of astrology. If you get into the house of a noble man, even without your knowledge, your thoughts will be transformed into much better ones. Therefore, when Venus and Mercury reside in Sagittarius, it will not deliver the best benefits and it will not deliver the worst effects. Now let us see the effects of conjunction of Venus and Mercury in Capricorn and Aquarius. Let me put together these two houses because both the houses are owned by Saturn. What is the difference between Capricorn and Aquarius? Capricorn is a movable sign and Aquarius is a fixed sign. The planets which are in mobile Rashi will deliver more benefits. Based on this concept, Venus and Mercury that reside in Capricorn, which is a Chara Rashi, will deliver the best benefits. When they are in conjunction without any influence or connection of other planets, this will certainly happen. When Venus and Mercury alone or in conjunction in Capricorn, based on the Ascendant, it will deliver the auspicious house effects of the Capricorn. Especially for the team of Venus Ascendants such as Taurus, Gemini, Virgo, Libra, Capricorn and Aquarius, Venus and Mercury will deliver the auspicious house effects of Capricorn. Based on the strength of the Dispositor, Saturn, you have to make further predictions. Now let us see the house of Aquarius where this conjunction happens. Aquarius is also a friendly house for both Mercury and Venus. The house Lord Saturn is a friendly planet to both the planets Mercury and Venus. Therefore Venus and Mercury will definitely deliver benefits when they reside in Aquarius but comparatively it will be less than in Capricorn. Based on the strength of the dispositor, the benefits will be more or less. Finally, let us see the effect of conjunction of Venus and Mercury in Pisces. Here Venus gets exalted and Mercury gets debilitated. But when these two planets are in conjunction, Mercury gets Nichabanga Raja Yoga status. I hope you remember when I explained about Virgo, I told when there is a conjunction of Venus and Mercury, that is a debilitated planet and exalted planet in Virgo, I told Mercury will transfer its energy and it will lose its own energy by passing its strength to Venus. The same logic you have to apply here. 
when the conjunction of venus and mercury happens in pisces where venus is exalted and mercury is debilitated venus will donate its energy to mercury and venus will become weaker than mercury here mercury will be definitely stronger than venus because venus donates its exalted strength to mercury which is debilitated based on the degrees of conjunction between venus and mercury venus will lose its strength proportionately you have to definitely consider the degree of deep exaltation and deep debilitation degree of the planets you have to first of all assess the status of the exalted planet and the debilitated planet you have to definitely check the deep exaltation degree and deep debilitation degree of venus and mercury respectively in some criteria mercury will definitely get more strength than venus though venus is exalted in pisces this concept is called nicha bhanga raja yoga status when a debilitated planet is in conjunction with another planet which has got its own house status it is nicha bhanga when a debilitated planet is in conjunction with an exalted planet or purnima it is said to be nicha bhanga raja yoga status i have explained this very well in many of my videos so here mercury which is in conjunction with venus gains more strength and sometimes based on the degrees of conjunction with mercury venus will maintain good strength it is a good house for both the planets because this is the house of jupiter here this planetary conjunction will make the native to be extremely intelligent to enjoy the life if you observe the people whose venus is exalted in pisces they will not bother about anything going around them because they are getting good food they enjoy a comfortable life all sorts of luxuries so they don't bother about what goes around them based on the house responsibility of venus and mercury the dasha will deliver its effects you have to definitely check whether it is a functional benefic or a functional malefic you have to check especially if mercury is a functional malefic because if it is in close conjunction with exalted venus mercury will gain more strength so a functional malefic should not gain strength and based on the strength of the dispositor you have to make further predictions you have to check whether the ascendant lord is strong enough to enjoy the benefits and you have to check the strength of jupiter in whose house the conjunction happens mr ajay the premium video subscriber has asked a very good question he requested how to make predictions for the conjunction of venus and mercury i have explained the conjunction of venus and mercury in all the 12 houses in the natural zodiac and more importantly i have told some points about how to assess the strength of the planet based on my concepts of subhatva which is very very important and very helpful while we make predictions i have explained the levels of subhatva of different planets i have written an article regarding the level of parbatva and in this video i have explained how to assess different levels of subhatva of the planets i hope you all understand these concepts that i explained whatever i explained in this video is very very important for predictions listen to this again and again so that you can explore much more when you are making predictions of the natal chart if only you recall the concepts if only you listen to the concepts again and again your mind will open up to explore and to apply the concepts in the natal chart and you will be able to apply very spontaneously while you're making predictions thank you keep writing your feedback to astro.write to us at gmail.com